welcome to the Kyle Phoenix Show, Course in Miracles, lesson number four. Let's jump right into the lesson. These thoughts do not mean anything. They are like the things I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place. Unlike the preceding ones, these exercises do not begin with the idea for the day. In these practice periods, begin with noting the thoughts that are crossing your mind for about a minute. Then apply the idea to them. If you are already aware of unhappy thoughts, use them as subjects for the idea. Do not, however, select only the thoughts you think are quote-unquote bad. You will find, if you train yourself to look at your thoughts, that they represent such a mixture that, in a sense, none of them can be called good or bad. This is why they do not mean anything. In selecting the subjects for the application of today's idea, the usual specificity is required. Do not be afraid to use good thoughts as well as bad. None of them represent your real thoughts which are being covered up by them. The good ones are but shadows of what lies beyond and shadows make sight difficult. The bad ones are blocks to sight and make seeing impossible. Do not want either. This is a major exercise and will be repeated from time to time in somewhat different forms. <coughs> Excuse me. The aim here is to train you in the first steps towards the goal of separating the meaninglessness from the meaningful. It is a first attempt in the long-range purpose of learning to see the meaninglessness as outside you and the meaningful within. It is also the beginning of training your mind to recognize what is the same and what is different. In using your thoughts for application of the idea for today, identify each thought by the central figure or event it contains. For example, this thought about blank does not mean anything. It is like the things I see in this room, on this street, and so on. You can also use the idea for a particular thought that you recognize as harmful. This practice is useful but is not a substitute for the more random procedures to be followed for the exercises. Do not, however, examine your mind for more than a minute or so. You are too inexperienced as yet to avoid a tendency to become pointlessly preoccupied. Further, since these exercises are the first of their kind, you may find the suspension of judgment and connection with thoughts particularly difficult. Do not repeat these exercises more than three or four times during the day. We'll return to them later. So that's pretty exciting. Not all of the course actually the lessons as you progress further are this much detailed or kind of instructions or guidelines around the exercises. I'm going to read the lesson one more time and then go into a little interpretation of it. These thoughts not mean anything. They're like the things I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place. Okay, so we've talked about before how we're looking at our thoughts and how we are seeing one, that we are not our thoughts, that everything that we have, that we perceive through this level of thought is not necessarily our identity. The first step that the Course is attempting us to get to do in this exercise is to stop identifying with our thoughts. So I am not my thoughts. There are plenty of times where I personally, Kyle, have some upset thoughts of people. I was actually in line yesterday you have to fill in a sign-in sheet to go to class. And there was a person, she was standing ahead of me, and she's filling, she's filling, and she's filling, she's filling, she's filling, she's filling, and she's filling. So it's name, where you're going, time in, and then when you leave, time out from the building. So she's filling, and she's filling, she's filling. And I'm actually standing on a stairwell that slightly goes up, so I'm like two steps up. This person is down on the ground floor signing in. And then so another person comes in behind me, and then another person, so we're actually forming a line to this little quick Bob Smith, Judy Jones, you know, classroom seven, classroom five, six o'clock, and just go on about your way. And so I had the thought, okay, this is irritating. This is irritating me. And previous to this, I'd been in the supermarket, and there was a gentleman in one of those wheelie um, hovercraft automated wheelchair things. And so he was directing himself in, 
And so it was a double door, so it was completely open, so he could actually just wheel himself in. But one of the registers was kind of right there, and so his car, his little hovercraft is right there, and there's a little partition of fruit and stuff there. So he's trying to go in between them. So mother and her daughter start pushing their cart this way, so he can't quite go this way. Standing at the edge of this register, having their items packed as this large guy, this guy turns, looks at the guy in the wheelchair, and doesn't move. So now the guy in the wheelchair is doing this little incremental pushing back and forth to try and get through. My thought is, this is upsetting. So finally, I turn to the larger guy I was standing there and say, excuse me, he's trying to get through. Oh, oh, oh. Now, I saw him because I've been standing there inch by inch by inch stepping with this guy. So I'm turn, look, see the man couldn't get by and not move. My thought might be, I'm upset at this man, how dare this man do that, that's disrespectful, how could he be this way to a disabled person? But that is not who I am. But I can have that thought. That thought happens in a flash. And then I say, you know something, I'm not attached to that thought, so I release that thought. That thought is just that, it's just a thought. It's just a post-it note, it's just an observation in the universe. It's not a judgment, it might be a level of analysis for me to understand what space and reality I'm currently occupying, but it's not necessarily a full-blown, you know, he should've, he could've, he would've, he's a bad person. So I'm not attaching any morality to my thought, and I'm not attaching any morality back at myself in my thought. Wow, Kyle, you really kind of just tore him up in your head. So back to the lady standing in line. So she's going and slower. And so I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, wow, is it really that difficult? Really? So there's a level of judgment in there. There's a level, and I catch myself and I say, well, maybe for her it is. I don't know. Maybe it is because I did think to myself, I thought, wow, you know, is there a little retardation going on here? And then when that thought happens, I look at that thought and I say, you know something? That thought might be true. There might be a little retardation going on here. Now, that's not a judgment. That's just a thought. My thought just comes and observes and pops and it just hits little signs. That's all our thoughts are. They're just post-it notes. Your thoughts are not you. And more importantly, your thoughts are not your mind. So your mind and your thoughts are two different things. Your mind is, in a sense, generating just by energy. It's giving off static. And the static it gives off are your thoughts. So be back with the next lesson. Lesson number five, I'm never upset for the reason I think. This idea, like the preceding one, can be used with any person, situation, or event you think is causing you pain. Apply it specifically to whatever you believe is the cause of your upset, using a description of the feeling in whatever term seems accurate to you. The upset may seem to be fear, worry, depression, anxiety, anger, hatred, jealousy, or any number of forms, all of which will be perceived as different. This is not true. However, until you learn that form does not matter, each form becomes a proper subject for the exercises for the day. Applying the same idea to each of them separately is the first step in ultimately recognizing they are all the same. When using the idea for today for a specific perceived cause of an upset in any form, use both the name of the form in which you see the upset and the cause which you ascribe it to. For example, I am not angry at blank for the reason I think. I am not afraid of blank for the reason I think. But again, this should not be substituted for practice, periods in which you first search your mind for sources of upset in which you believe and forms of upset which you think result. 
In these exercises, more than in the preceding ones, you may find it hard to be indiscriminate and to avoid giving greater weight to some subjects than to others. It might help to precede the exercise with the statement, there are no small upsets. They are all equally disturbing to my peace of mind. Then examine your mind for whatever is distressing you, regardless of how much or how little you think it is doing so. You may also find yourself less willing to apply today's idea to some perceived sources of upset than to others. This occurs, think first of this. I cannot keep this form of upset and let the others go. For the purpose of these exercises, then, I will regard them all as the same. Then search your mind for no more than a minute or so and try to identify a number of different forms of upset that are disturbing you, regardless of the relative importance you may give them. Apply the idea for today to each of them, using the name of both the source of the upset as you perceive it and of the feeling as you experience it. Further examples are, I am not worried about blank for the reason I think. I am not depressed about blank for the reason I think. Three or four times during the day is enough. Again, as you'll see if you check out the Kyle Phoenix blog, what I've done is I posted a link to a PDF copy of the course. So you can type in Kyle Phoenix blog to Google or you can follow through on the KylePhoenix.com, KylePhoenixSite.com to the blog section as well as has documents up there, other PDF formats. So you can follow along with this if need be. So, when we look at Lesson 5, I am never upset for the reasons I think. Again, we are looking at, it's, also, it's a form of metacognition. Metacognition is thinking about your thinking. So the first level of thinking is generally I am, impulse. What is happening, what is occurring right now in the immediate. The second level of thinking is a level of questioning to what is happening. So this is happening, what is it? I'm actually taking it to a second level. A third level is to maybe to examine my assumptions about what is happening. So I might think, you know, something, I'm upset about such and such and such. So I've identified it, I am upset. So that's level one, that's level two. Level three is such and such and such. So I'm actually looking at what such and such and such is. I'm critically examining it on some level. Level four is questioning that. So I might be upset. I'd say one of the things I was upset about just recently was the school registration process. So there's a whole network of things that you have to do and applications you have to submit and chairs you sit in and checks you have to write and cards you have to swipe and all different kinds of things to get a class, to pay for a class, to be in a class. Um, at Columbia University, which is a good system. It's a fine system, but there's a process to the system. <clears throat> so it turns out that a series of classes I was interested in um, or that I needed to actually take for the thing I'm working on in adult education had switched from one department to another. So then I had to go, that department I was originally trying to be a part of wasn't part, didn't exist anymore, and I had to go to the other department and then kind of petition them almost anew. So I had to start a new relationship. So I was like, wow, gee, I'm frustrated by this. So it's like, wow, I'm frustrated by this process. And to some degree, walking through, if anybody's ever been to Teachers College, it's a bit of a maze because there's lots of interconnected buildings and they connect by stairwells and elevators. Once you get it down pat, you can move through the building pretty fast. But when you're kind of new and your anxiety's going and your frustration's going and stuff, and kind of rankle you, especially when you have to go back several times, you have to go to that building, you have to get this, you have to download this offline, you have to print this off. Everybody's helpful. There are lots of attendants and different directors and associates and all those kinds of people that are helpful, but it's still a process. So I got to a point where I was just really, really frustrated and I had to come back. And I was teaching classes right across the street at the Columbia campus. So I'm going back and forth between teaching classes to managing my own class schedule. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth each day as it's going through the week. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why am I so upset at this? So what if I'm not upset at the first level or the second level or the third level or the fourth level. Maybe there's a fifth level to this. So what's really going on behind this? So that's where the course gives you the example of I'm not angry at blank for the reason I think or I'm not afraid of blank for the reason I think. So when I really looked at it, it came down to a level of anxiety, a level of acceptance. Gee, you know, it takes 
it takes some moxie, it takes some energy, it takes some time, and it took a real buildup for me to decide to change my whole career span and time and where I was working at in the field that I was in, and then to start working for Columbia was a good thing, and you know, it's, you know, so, but you've got to so accommodate your schedule to their schedule and their schedule to your schedule, so it's hit and miss and classes this hour, but then you have a two hour break, and then it's another hour and a half here, and then a half an hour break, and you have to go to that building. So it's kind of back and forth, and I said, you know something, what I'm really experiencing it's not so much the frustration at this departmental thing not working out for my classes. What I'm really experiencing is the anxiety. Can I handle this? Can I do this? And, you know, I'm walking through all these big, beautiful, ornate buildings, you know, and it's marble, and it's, this one's 200 years old, and that one's 100 years old, you know, and I'm standing in front of classes, and I'm presenting, you know, and I'm presenting my ideas and my thoughts, and I realize a lot of that's anxiety. So really, my frustration, what I thought I was upset about, because everybody was really wonderfully and helpful for switching from one department to another with classes, I was really anxious and nervous and dealing with some level of self-esteem about being there. So we are never experiencing just the emotion we think that we're experiencing or the thought that we think that we're experiencing. We're always experiencing something under that. And generally that thing that's under it is something that is frightening or unattractive or we don't know how to handle, which is why we're willing to experience maybe the cheaper emotion or the more impulse emotion on the top rather than dealing with, well, what's down here? What's the next level of this emotion? So that's our lesson. I am never upset for the reason I think. Thank you very much. I am upset because I see something that is not there. The exercises with this idea are very similar to the preceding ones. Again, it is necessary to name both the form of upset, anger, fear, worry, depression, and so on, and the perceived source very specifically for any application of the idea. For example, I am angry at blah 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 or blank because I see something that is not there. I am worried about such and such or whatever because I see something that is not there. Today's idea is useful for application to anything that seems to upset you and can profitably be used throughout the day for that purpose. However, the three or four practice periods which are required should be preceded by a minute or so of mind searching as before and the application of the idea to each upsetting thought uncovered in the search. Again, if you insist or resist, excuse me, applying the idea to some upsetting thoughts more than others, remind yourself of the two cautions stated in the previous lesson. There are no small upsets. They are all equally disturbing to my peace of mind. And I cannot keep this form of upset and let the others go. For the purposes of these exercises then, I will regard them all as the same. So where does this actually take us? And where this takes us is looking at who we are, how we are experiencing our upset. So I might be experiencing something, I'm not upset because I see something that is not there. Or I am upset because I see something that is there. So I was thinking of, I try to think for each one of these, some kind of personal or relevant example that will help in this context. And I was thinking about that I was frustrated with work. So I was like a work example. I was frustrated with work. And what I was frustrated with was I was teaching. This was a few years ago before I kind of learned really what to do with these feelings or when one is upset. And I was frustrated because I thought I was teaching for a nonprofit. 
I was teaching a really extensive long course. It was a big, huge skill development, computers, vocational, motivational. I mean, there were lots and lots of layers to this. And there was a contingent that of students that joined the class, but really because of the nature of the nonprofit, because of the nature of the situation that they were in, they were already receiving public funds or social security or welfare or different things like that so that they didn't have an impetus like some of the others in the class who actually wanted to get these skills to go out and go to work tomorrow and to produce. And part of what I was looking at, you know, as a teacher, particularly as a teacher of this thing I was teaching, you want to teach the people the skills, and they then go and do it. And to some degree, we were also tracking who goes, takes the skill, makes the skill work, because that's how we were getting the money from different funders, and to proof that this program works, thereby sustain it, give us more money, allow us to do it bigger, better, different places. So that's so my, so I had a, um, probably now I've learned it's about maybe 10% of the students who just didn't care. A little bit because of the nonprofit I was at, it was maybe 20%. But there was a heavy contingent that were in there, so I'm, I'm having this imbalance in there. So one day, I really got upset at the students, and I generally don't get, you know, you have to push students a little bit, but I generally don't get, I am upset at you. Stop doing that. You know, I don't like this. I, Kyle, don't like this. So I was upset because I see something that is not there. And the not there that I was not seeing was that there will always be a section of students that are not in it for the outcome that the teacher, me, may be thinking or have designed this whole product around. But that what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to detach from that and give 100%. It's where you don't play favorites. It's where you just give 100%. So that, and that was a lesson to actually learn, and that was one of the greater lessons about that. It was also a great lesson that this was an abnormal class uh, population. So this was a much higher percentage than I dealt with before that had a level of apathy or disinterest or were just filling their time, basically. So that when I thought that, I was upset at what was occurring. What I was really upset with was myself. I was upset that only 80% are loving the ambrosia of this or manifesting or, or going to some level of fruition around this. So I was upset that why isn't my left hand working? And if we translate that back sometimes, sometimes we take criticism to focus, we focus completely on the left hand of criticism, we can have 99%, 99 pounds of adulation and accolades in our right hand. So I was criticizing myself, I was attacking myself, and that wasn't there. I've since learned in teaching that it's not always going to be 100%. Sometimes it's 80, sometimes it's 70. Good home run, it's 90 percent of the population that gets it. I've even been teaching classes sometimes where I know just by the demographics it's going to be 50 percent. That is going to be the attrition rate. And once I learned to back off from everybody having to want and love this right now, I really became a better teacher. So again, Lesson number six, I am upset because I see something that is not there. And what I was seeing was a criticism about myself and my ability and the work that I was doing. As always, this is Kyle Phoenix, and this is another lesson from A Course in Miracles. Lesson number seven, I see only the past. I see only the past. Lesson number seven, get my mic on there. This idea is particularly difficult to believe at first, yet it is the rationale for all of the preceding ones. 
It is the reason why nothing you see means anything. It is the reason why you have given everything you see all the meaning that it has for you. It is the reason why you do not understand anything you see. It is the reason why your thoughts do not mean anything and why they are like the things you see. It is the reason why you are never upset for the reason you think. It is the reason why you are upset because you see something that is not there. I see only the past. So, how do we, let me just, so, in the concept that I see only the past, the problem is, is that the way that we define ourselves as human beings is partially through our memories. So, we define ourselves both by this tangible reality that we're a part of, that we are perceiving with this body, but we also define ourselves with our memories. Our memories lead to people identifying things for you and you then knowing what that thing is. So, we are constantly living in a duality of time. We're living into a project or a triality of time, actually. We're projecting into the future what I'm going to do, where I'm going to be, what I'm going to say, what I'm going to eat, who I'm going to meet, where I'm going, blah, 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 all of those different kinds of things. We're also living in the conscious now of knowing that in order to get to that future step or state, I must walk here, I must do that, I must get on the train, I must get in the car, I must go to work, I must get up early, I must get up a little bit later, all of those kinds of things. We're also planning the now to move us or maintain in some way or to create the future. But we're also constantly living in our programmed past to define what we are moving. So the Kyle that I know, the Kyle that I am, is simply this being's definition of the past. And the past that this being identifies this body and this identity and this experience as is known as Kyle. So I see only the past. When I look at myself, I see the past because I have memories which are more of the past, of myself as a child, as myself as a teenager, of myself when I was in my 20s. I see myself constantly in the past, yet I know that I am in the present even as I plan for the future. So, this is all really. This is this is started where the course is really starting to work on dismantling the way that we sometimes blithely just move through time without really thinking about our thoughts in time, our perception in time, our relationship to time and why we're relating to it in that way. So you're like, okay, Kyle, this is really beautiful and esoteric. But, you know, it got really metaphysical there for a moment about just the continuum of time. But how do I apply this to today, to the now, to the now that might be the past as I project into the future? So I see only the past. When I think of the fact that I see only the past, I can then identify that that seeing is merely a thought. Ah, now we're starting to really open up. Because if my seeing is a thought, if my memories are a thought, and my thoughts are things that I am, the I of me, of Kyle, can be detached from, neither good, neither bad, sometimes they just are. They just are. So when I was, I think I was about 12 or 13 years old, my cousins and I were playing, and one of my cousins threw a rock, and the rock hit me under the eye. I have a little small scar there from it. So I can identify, remember where it happened, remember we lived in Brooklyn, we, lived, we were out by Coney Island. I remember the day it was, and I remember going upstairs, and I remember how close it came, and my parents and his mother and my aunt freaking out about it and everything. I remember all of that. That was the past. Now, how I feel about him today might have to do with some of that projection of the past, of how I see him in the past. That's not necessarily who he is today. So I may release that. I may say, you know something, it was a game, it was foolish, it was children, it was an accident, it's over. Thank you. It's a thought. It's maybe a special kind of thought because it's a memory, but it's still just a thought. 
even how our brains work, this is really wonderful how our uh, synaptic paths work, is that the way that we, this is, this is actually, I'll go into this, the way that we remember stuff is not that we remember the stuff. What we're actually remembering is we're creating a memory of the memory. So when you have a memory, you don't have a, you're not having the memory, you're having a memory of having the memory. And then you're having a memory of having the memory of having the memory. And then you're having a memory of having the memory of having the memory of having the memory. So we're constantly kind of building this layer cake. And every time we build this layer cake of memories, sometimes we alter it a little bit. So was it a big rock? Was it a little rock that he threw? Was it on purpose? What was the gleam in his eye when he did it? You know, he never really liked me. It was on purpose. It was an absolute accident. He was aiming for my...